we are at AHA in Orlando with Dr. Reddy, who uh, presented a very interesting uh, follow-up uh, study with a new generation of uh, a device that occludes the left atrial appendage in uh, patients with atrial fibrillation with the goal to prevent strokes. Uh, you studied uh, the watch one device in the initial trial with PROTECT, and now we are following up with this new generation of uh, devices. Why, why are you doing that? What prompted this study? Well, what, we've, what we learned in PROTECT AF, which used the first generation Watchman device, was that the appendage can be closed, and, it, and once we close the appendage, we have an effectiveness in terms of preventing strokes that is actually a little bit better than warfarin. Now the problem was, in the original PROTECT study, the, there, were, there were some safety events. And the major one um, was pericardial effusion with tamponade. So that meaning at the time of implantation, because of mechanical trauma of putting in the device, uh, somewhere almost about 5% of patients had at least one instance of, uh, of pericardial tamponade. Now, the issue is that uh, on the one hand, these tamponades, did, they did not translate into any long-term disability or mortality. The patients were treated, uh, they had pericardial syntesis, uh, either catheter or surgical, and they all left the hospital and again, had no long-term disability. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, 5% pericardial tamponade rate was still too high. So we've learned a couple of things. First, with increased operator experience, uh, the tamponade rate is now much lower. Now it's closer to between 1.5 to 2%. Mm -hmm. So st it's not zero yet, but it's much, much better. And it's very clear that as one gets more, uh, more experience, the risk of having tamponade falls uh, tremendously. And there are other technical things, or procedural aspects to the procedure that, that we've learned uh, to further minimize the chance of tamponade. In terms of what's published, there was a registry that followed the initial PROTECT AF study. And in that registry, again, with more experienced operators, the pericardial tamponade rate was just under 2%. So we're getting better, but ideally we'd be at 0%. And, um, and that was the purpose of this uh, next abstract, uh, the one we just presented called uh, EVOLVE. EVOLVE is a trial that uh, was conducted in Europe, mm -hmm. in three centers in Europe, uh, and it involved a new generation Watchman device. And this one is not yet commercially available. They're uh, making enhancements, et cetera. But the point is that using this new device, which uh, was specifically designed to be atraumatic, we had no instances of tamponade. Um, so, so clearly, with improvements in technology and improvements in operative experience, we're able to uh, bring the, the complication rate down to a much, much uh, lower level. And what are we doing? I know that you have you have done a lot of cases in Europe, and, and in Europe these devices have been available for a little bit longer than the U.S. Yeah. What are we doing in the U.S. with the Watchman device? So, uh, to understand that, we have to really understand the Protect AF data. So, Protect AF was a randomized trial that compared the Watchman device to warfarin in patients who could take warfarin but didn't want to take warfarin. And what the trial basically showed was on the intention to treat analysis, it the Watchman device was non-inferior to warfarin mm -hmm. in terms of preventing stroke and, uh, and uh, mortality, and cardiovascular mortality. The, uh, now, it was non-inferior, it wasn't superior. But there was a second analysis that was performed, uh, it was a pre-specified analysis, and it was it's the post-procedure analysis, meaning that uh, after the procedure is performed, so let's say you are able to, f to put the device in safely and effectively, then what happens? And it turns out when you analyze that way, that is in those patients who actually received the device, the risk of stroke and mortality was actually lower in the, in the Watchman group than in the um, warfarin, warfarin group. The reason for that is because at the time of implantation, there were several instances of stroke that occurred uh, because of the implantation process itself. That is, at the time, at the time of implantation, uh, either air or clot embolized from the sheath that was used to deliver the catheter to the, to the left atrial appendage. Um, we learned about that in the original PROTECT AF trial. Uh, based on that experience, we modified our technique a little bit, and in the registry that followed, that procedure stroke rate is basically close to zero. Okay. So how do we interpret all this? Well, on the one hand, I think from a scientific perspective, the fact is PROTECT AF demonstrated that if you can take the appendage out of the equation, in this population of non valvular AFib patients, that is, this local therapy is actually superior to systemic anticoagulation with warfarin. The second point is uh, less of a scientific, more of a product question, 
if you look at the Watchman device itself and the act of implanting, etc., um, uh, we are able to now do this procedure with a par with a peri-procedural stroke rate that's close to zero. Mm -hmm. So I think these are the these are the favorable things. Now, having said that. The, and so because of that, um, there's been a lot of interest and enthusiasm and the number of other devices also that are being uh, developed. But what's going on in the United States? Well, the FDA looked at the data and said, yes, on the efficacy side looks good. On the safety side, you had safety events and you need to prove to us that, um, uh, that this is actually superior, mm -hmm. that, that you can deal with these safety mm -hmm. issues. So the next trial is called Prevail. and This has already uh, started. Um, we're a little over halfway through in terms of enrollment being conducted just in the United States. Um, and what's interesting about this trial, it's very similar design to the PROTECT trial. So taking patients who can take Coumadin and randomizing them to either the device or Coumadin. The major differences are the inclusion exclusions are a little bit different. Instead of CHADS 1 or higher in PREVAIL, it's CHADS 2 or higher with mm -hmm. some CHADS 1 patients. Um, the other major difference is that um, in PREVAIL, at least a quarter of the devices are going to be implant are being implanted by physicians who are not involved in Protect AF. So okay. completely naive um, operators uh, in terms of experience. But the idea is, uh, since we learn things in Protect AF, can that be translated to new operators? And so that's going to be very important from the safety side. And of course, we'll have more efficacy data to hopefully corroborate uh, um, the, the results of Protect. Excellent and. Let me ask you for... And, I'm sorry. And in terms of timeline, uh, since you asked that, uh, as I said, Prevail is a little over halfway enrolled. My guess is that we'll have data probably in about a year, year and a half, something like that, just to give you a general idea of where okay. we are. And when just for the you know for the general cardiologist, I think it's, it's important to hear from somebody like you that implants a device. When, when do you personally think that a patient should be referred for appendage closure? When, when you see a patient in, if, in the clinic with AFib, yeah. when are you thinking, maybe I should close the appendage? Yeah, it's a good question. Look, certainly those, pa those patients, I think the, the best population to consider are the patients that are the oldest patients, the older patients, I should say. Older patients, um, I'm talking over the age of 75, over the age of 85, these are patients who we all feel uncomfortable with systemic anticoagulation mm -hmm. therapy because there's a risk of falls. There's also the polypharmacy issues. Um, and so because of all these reasons, I think the oldest patients are the most, are the most ideal candidates. Um, now, how safe is it? That would be a good question. Mm -hmm. Older patients in general don't tolerate procedures, right? Sure. Well, in PROTECT and the CAP registry that followed PROTECT, we had about a little over 1,000 patients that were implanted. Of those, the number of patients over the age of 75 was about 450, a little over 450. So that's a, a lot of patients yes. that were implanted that were over the age of 75. In fact, we had, I, I believe, about 75 or 80 patients over the age of 85. I mean, a very elderly population. So the point I'm trying to make is that it's the, I think the really the elderly that would probably benefit the most. When you look at the fact that, um, you know, it's, it's a group that you don't want to treat with systemic anticoagulation. I see. And the other thing that I, I find very interesting is that, you know, the landscape of anticoagulation is changing yeah. dramatically. We are used to compare everything to the vitamin K antagonist, right. asenocumerol in, in Europe and warfarin in the U.S. And now we have this, all these new uh, oral TNA inhibitors. We have the Vigatron with a lot of data in, mm -hmm. in AF and DVT. Um, so how do you think this is going to change the, the way you uh, approach patients with atrial fibrillation when it comes to stroke prevention? Yeah, look, there's no doubt the, the factor 2 and the factor 10 a inhibitors are a huge advance. I, I think there a lot of patients will, be, will benefit. Um, and, and in fact, but the question about how does this interact with appendage closure, there are a couple of points I'd like to make. Number one, I do think that the list of contraindicated patients are going to shrink a little bit mm -hmm. because there are patients who can take a Pixaban who are considered contraindicated. We know that from um, Averroes. But having said that, it's the, these drugs also have some issues. If you look in, in the clinical trials themselves, somewhere between uh, a fifth to a quarter of patients could not stay on the anticoagulation sure. over the course of the follow-up, uh, one to two years follow-up. Number two, the risk of bleeding is still there. Mm -hmm. uh, GI bleeding um, is certainly true with with um, 
uh, rivaroxaban and with dabigatran. Mm -hmm. With the pixaban, the risk of bleeding is lower, but GI bleeding is still there. And it's particularly uh, greatest uh, in those patients who are older. Again, mm -hmm. the same population that does not do well with polypharmacy. Polypharmacy, by the way, you know, dabigatran is nice that it doesn't have interaction with drug and di or diet. Neither do rivaroxaban or apixaban, mm -hmm. but rivaroxaban and apixaban may have some issues in terms of drug-drug interactions. So, so I think that it's not perfect. I think there's still a population of patients, again, particularly the oldest patients, the older, oldest patients. The last point I'd like to make is the risk of bleeding is particularly important in, uh, when you look at concomitant antiplatelet agent use. We know this is true for dabigatran. It, with rivaroxaban, it, we know it's true if you take either aspirin or Plavix, it doubles the risk of bleeding. Mm -hmm. This is what we know from from um, Rocket. And um, uh, and even for Apixaban, which uh, appears to be an excellent drug from the presentations and what we heard from Aristotle. But then, you know, there are the, the, the trials with the in coronary syndrome patients where uh, you see that Apixaban plus antiplatelet agent really increases the risk of bleeding. So I think that there's still a lot of patients, uh, particularly in the cardiovascular, uh, with cardiovascular diseases, atrial fibrillation, coronary disease, et cetera, who may still benefit from appendix closure. The la last question I have is when it comes to efficacy, uh, you yeah. co we compare uh, left atrial appendage closure in PROTECT against warfarin. Now we know from historical data, and including PROTECT AF, that uh, at best 65-68% of patients are in therapeutic range yeah. because of Good. a narrow yeah. therapeutic, uh, therapeutic window. The, the comparison uh, against the new drugs, the new kids on the block, do you mm -hmm. think it's going to be fair? Do you think it's going to be harder to demonstrate non-inferiority? You know, it's a good question. The answer you could go both ways. On the one hand, you're absolutely right. It's hard to keep patients in therapeutic range with, with warfarin. The flip side is with the novel anticoagulants, you know, if you miss a dose, the levels come down pretty quickly. And what's less clear, I think, when you go out of the trial environment and you go to the clinical practice environment, what will be the adherence um, uh, by patients to take these mm -hmm. medications? Remember, we can't follow them. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult. I mean, they're impractical tests to actually assess the anticoagulation levels. So on the one hand, it could be better with the novel anticoagulants in terms of um, uh, keeping the the anticoagulation levels to the appropriate levels. On the, on the other hand, it could be worse because you may see more fluctuation. Sure. At least with warfarin, even if you miss a dose, it's relatively stable for a little bit of time. So I, I don't know. We need to study this. Yes, we have to. Well, thank you for your time, and um, it was great to discuss with you the, the impact of the new generation of uh, Watchman devices in patients with AF. We're from uh, Orlando in uh, Florida at the AHA scientific meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you.